Beware, citizen. You are now departing from the world of allowable opinion. The Tom Woods Show. Welcome, everybody. It's Thursday, February 13th, 2014. Bob Murphy joins us today. There are some fallacies that need to be smashed. And who better to do it than Bob Murphy? The two of us are going to go through five fallacies that, once again, Rolling Stone magazine is responsible for. I've got a sixth fallacy I'm going to start off with, with Bob. But some of these things just have to be answered. And we're going to have fun answering them. And we're going to learn stuff as we answer them. It's going to be great. What a great experience this is. Stay tuned after my conversation with Bob for a list of my upcoming events. I've just added one. I'll have another one that I'll be adding as well. Thank you for the questions you guys have proposed that I ask Judge Napolitano when he joins us next week for the 100th episode of The Tom Woods Show. And, of course, thank you guys for subscribing to the show on iTunes and Stitcher. All right, you all know Bob Murphy. Bob is the author of The Politically Incorrect Guide to Capitalism, The Politically Incorrect Guide to the Great Depression and the New Deal, Lessons for the Young Economist, a textbook you can find online and download for free. He's also the author of Chaos Theory, of study guides for several of the major Austrian treatises, and he blogs at consultingbyrpm.com, and I strongly urge you to follow Bob's blog. Bob Murphy, thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me, Tom. Always a pleasure. All right. I know this is an old article from Rolling Stone, and you know people are going to say to me, Woods, why are you going after all these articles in Rolling Stone? And the answer isn't that Rolling Stone is a really important publication from an academic point of view, but because if Rolling Stone is promoting these ideas, then probably some people believe this stuff, and it's useful to know what the answers to these arguments are. But before we even get to that, Bob, I want to go over just something I emailed you uh, the other day, just very briefly. I was reading an article that said that one of the benefits of raising the minimum wage and the idea these days is that there are just so many benefits, you can hardly count them. One of the benefits would be that it would be like a permanent stimulus program because people who would be on the receiving end of the benefits of the minimum wage are, by definition, low-income workers. And low-income workers tend to spend most of their income. You know, this, this is sort of like this Keynesian principle that, you know, the, the more income you have, the more you're likely to save of it. So... These people are, are more likely to blow all their income, and we all know that's what the economy needs, is, is people who just blow all their income and don't just sit on it. So it's a permanent stimulus program that would be created by raising the minimum wage. I want the Murphy response to this. Okay, well, there's lots of things wrong with that. So one is, even on its own terms, it's not obvious that the total wage bill would be higher if they implemented a, a hike in the minimum wage. And the article you sent me from Ron Unz was proposing to raise the minimum wage to $12 an hour. And so, I mean, that would just be catastrophic in terms of the employment opportunities for the people who are currently earning the minimum wage, let alone the people who are below that level. So even on its own terms, it's not obvious. So what I'm saying, just to be clear, is suppose they got rid of the minimum wage, it's conceivable that employers would be giving more total dollars to people who don't have a lot of skills than they are right now, or let alone if they raise the minimum wage at $12 an hour. So if if the goal is to get more money in the hands of lower-skilled people because they tend to not save as much, it's not obvious raising the minimum wage is the way to do that. So, In uh, other words, because fewer of them will have jobs in the first place, so therefore the overall payrolls will be lower. Right, exactly. Okay. That, that, yeah, if they raise the minimum wage by 50% and then employment drops off the cliff, it's not clear that the total amount of wages being paid is going to go up versus down. Uh, but beyond that, I mean, even... On the Keynesians' own terms, the point is not to have a perpetual stimulus, right? That even in terms of Paul Krugman's own analysis and so forth, the idea is that when the economy is in a slump, and in particular when there's a liquidity trap situation, then and only then does it make sense to try to provide a stimulus. So you wouldn't want to do something permanent like jack up the minimum wage to $12 an hour and think that that's a good way to stimulate the economy. So, I mean, there's that issue, too. But here we're kind of arguing on their own terms. I just challenge the whole premise that what you want to do is is encourage spending on consumption. I mean, that that's not true at all. It's not the case that our economy is based on consumption and the way you make the economy grow faster is to do people or cajole them 
into going and blowing their paychecks, and that if people say that's somehow going to be inimical to long-run economic growth and prosperity, I mean, that's a Keynesian perspective that's often announced uh, by the Keynesian bloggers and so forth, but it's, it's just not true that there's no reason to think that savings is going to hurt long-term growth. The economy just adjusts, prices adjust, as long as people's expectations are correct, then if people have a higher savings rate, that actually allows the economy to grow faster as the economy just retools and creates more drill presses and 18-wheelers as opposed to cranking out personal pan pizzas and uh, video games. All right, let's turn now to Rolling Stone here. Now, I know this has already been dealt with. Some people dealt with it some time ago, but look, I didn't even see this article, so therefore I assume other people haven't seen it and they haven't seen the the refutations. And plus, nobody's going to refute it better than Bob Murphy, so we might as well carry on. The first one of these five what is it called? Five economic reforms millennials should be fighting for is guaranteed work for everybody. Now, let's see. It says, I'm just going to I'm going to read these things. OK, unemployment blows. The easiest and most direct solution is for the government to guarantee that everyone who wants to contribute productively to society. Well, that's interesting. Not everyone, but everyone who wants to is able to earn a decent living in the public sector. OK. There are millions of people who want to work, and there's tons of work that needs needs doing. It's a no-brainer. And then they go on to say that, you know, look, the Works Progress Administration did this, etc. A job guarantee that paid a living wage would anchor prices, whatever that means, drive up conditions for workers at mega corporations like Walmart and McDonald's, and target employment for the poor and long-term unemployed, people to whom conventional stimulus money rarely trickles all the way down. The program would automatically expand during private sector downturns and contract during private sector upswings, balancing out the business cycle, which has no cause, by the way. The business cycle has no cause, just occurs. And and sending people from job to job rather than job to unemployment when times get tough. Some economists have proposed running a job guarantee through the nonprofit sector, which would make it even easier to suit the job to the worker. Imagine a world where people could contribute the skills that inspire them. Teaching, tutoring, urban farming, cleaning up the environment, painting murals, rather than telemarketing or whatever other stupid tasks bosses need done to supplement their millions. Sounds nice, doesn't it? I mean, this sounds like it was, I mean, my, you know, I was about to use a bad word there. I was about, I mean, this is so stupid. My 10-year-old would, could come up with, I mean, this just sounds, so, I, is this a, all right, look, I can't even say anything coherent here. You got to jump in here. Take over for me, Bob. The microphone is, is yours. This is like the angry Tom Wood. <laughs> I like. I'm so exasperated by this. All right, go ahead. Go okay. ahead. Well, yeah, just uh, this article is from a, a Jesse Meyerson, and I don't know right. if Jesse is a, is a man or a, a woman. Um, and, and you're right, though, Tom. I think it is. We, we do need to occasionally step back and just address these sorts of things because this this type of article is clearly what's influencing the widespread public support for what we think are horrible economic policies. So even though it's more challenging to you know grapple with Paul Samuelson's article on Bombaverki and capital theory, that's probably not what's motivating the people who are marching and, and protesting and asking for a twelve dollar minimum. Probably wage. not. I mean, I'm going to say Jesse Meyerson doesn't even know what Bombaverki's uh, capital theory is. Um, so yeah, it, it's. I mean, it's. It's funny. I mean, this person, this Meyerson, it's it's almost as if he or she just doesn't even understand the problem with socialism in the first place. Uh, for this one, you know, guaranteed work for everybody, we could just say, okay, well, let's just take it to its logical conclusion. I mean, what this person is saying is why not have people do things that are useful, like uh, picking up litter, painting murals, urban farming, teaching and tutoring, rather than whatever their bosses want them to do in order to make money. So it's a classic... Uh, familiar thing about a hey, production for people, not profit. The idea that what the market economy tells you to do is just about the bottom line, and can we imagine an alternate vision where people are doing things that are truly useful for the community? So, I mean, that's just a standard historical argument for socialism as opposed to capitalism. So, we could just take it to its logical extreme and say, why just do the, why just make this offer to the unemployed during recessions? Why not just say for everybody? Just do what the government asks you to do, or you know, just have everyone do whatever they want, and then that will be great, right? I mean, it does, sounds nice, doesn't it, to use the person's closing sentence? And then when you start thinking through the logic of that, you realize, well, wait a minute. I mean, if, if there's no outside incentives steering us and telling us where our labor is best deployed, well, what happens if everyone wants to just paint murals all day? Right, so all hello, yeah, right, yeah. And so they're... 
so there has to be some sort of feedback mechanism by which we get an idea of, you know, I have so many hours of labor I can contribute. Where is it most worthwhile for me to do that? And when you start, just to take a, a tack that Mises used in his book in so, on socialism called, coincidentally enough, Socialism, uh, it's, he, 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 what he ends up doing is he was describing, it was a little bit different context, but he was explaining the problem of allocating capital in a, in a socialist system, and so that he kept bringing in new innovations for, well, the central planners could deal with that issue by doing such and such. And then by the time he was done, he had just described the capitalist system. And so it's the same thing here. Just start from scratch and just start you know, listing out the attributes that a system of how you allocate labor would have to have to be defensible and efficient and you know, morally praiseworthy and say, well, people should be able to choose what they want to do. Nobody can literally force you to do something against your will, but you should also be rewarded in some sense and, and given incentives to do what others want you to do. That should play a part in it. And you end up describing the voluntary market economy where... You, no one forces you to do anything. You, so this person is wrong when they say that you're forced to do what your stupid bosses tell you to do. You can always quit in a market economy. But by the same token, if if there's a shortage of food and we're all going to starve to death, well, then the prices of agricultural products shoot up, and there's a lot of profits to be made by jumping into growing tomatoes. And so that's the way the market guides people. And again, just think through in the limit, wh- why wouldn't we just have the government assign jobs to everybody? And the answer is because they don't know what needs to be done. It would be a massive waste of, of labor resources, that the government's not in a position to say, oh, these workers ought to go here and these workers ought to go here. And anywhere in history that we've seen governments approaching that level, it's been awful. The person cites Roosevelt's New Deal. Well, the Great Depression was the longest slump in U.S. history. And so you have to ask, well, why did that happen? It's not because, oh, Roosevelt was just given a belt a bad hand. It was because the New Deal made the U.S. fester and stay stuck in that rut for years. You know what I find interesting also about this, and picking up on your point here, is that I bet Jesse Meyerson thinks that it's important to think about other people, and he probably thinks that capitalism is all about just looking out for number one, just thinking about yourself, but yet he, that's exactly the point of view he or she is taking here in, say, in, in saying that, look, you should, you should be able to do anything you want to do. But you know what? You're not the only person in the universe. And yeah, if you want to paint murals all day, go ahead and do it. If you find enough people who think what you're doing is a worthwhile use of resources, you can make a living that way. But to stand there and childishly demand that other people support you in whatever you've decided to do while blocking out of your head what people in society prefer that you do that would actually help them... You know, it's the the guy's a narcissist, actually, in in looking at the economy. Yeah, exactly. And by the way, I just googled him, and I, I'm pretty sure it is a guy. All right, good, good, good. Yeah, because that was you know, the, the context. Of, like, no, no woman would would speak with such reckless abandon. <laughs> And this would have been awkward using he, she the whole time. So, all right, let, let's let's go to number two: social security for all. I just I love how every one every one of them is like a dumb slogan, you know, like a bumper sticker thing. He said, "But let's think even bigger, you know, because as much as unemployment blows, so do jobs. What if people didn't have to work to survive? Enter the jaw-droppingly simple idea of a universal basic income." in which the government would just add a sum sufficient for subsistence to everyone's bank account every month, etc., etc. Um, we live in the age of 3D printers and self-replicating robots. Actual human workers are increasingly surplus to requirement. I, I don't know what that means. I mean, I know, what, I know what the words mean, but that's one major reason why we have such a big unemployment problem. A universal basic income would address this epidemic at the root, etc., etc., Oh, and would provide everyone, in the words of Duke Professor Kathy Weeks, time to cultivate new needs for pleasure, activities, senses, passions, effects, and so- uh, socialities that exceed the options of working and saving, producing and accumulating. <laughs> Put another way, a universal basic income combined with a job guarantee and other social programs could make participation in the labor force truly voluntary, thereby enabling people to get a life. Now, I, okay, first of all, we covered the robots are taking all our jobs away on this program with George Reisman. So do a search, look through the archives. Maybe I'll make a YouTube out of that one, actually, for the will robots take our jobs. So that one, that's been covered. But, Bob, what do you think about this jaw-droppingly simple idea of a universal basic income? I will give Jesse Meyerson one bit of credit. At least he didn't 
say to us, well, look, even Hayek said uh, we were spared that because he's never heard of Hayek. So let, let's give thanks for, for small favors. Right. He'd be like, Hayek, you mean that actress? Yeah, she's probably <laughs> Yeah, she probably favors it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, again, I mean, this, like I say, this is just this person obviously doesn't even know what the problem with socialism is because that's the, the lines on which they're going. And but here, I mean, as opposed to just saying, "Oh, come on, this is a pie in the sky, ridiculous notion." I mean, what the person is describing is exactly what the market economy gives you. I mean, as we progress, we I mean, just look, just look at, at how much free time we have during it. Because even when we're at work, in quotation marks, a lot of people spend a lot of time on Facebook and whatever, playing various games. And so, even at our difficult, onerous job by which we are forced to work in order to live. I mean, things are much better now than they were 100 years ago. And it's not because the government passed a bunch of laws. It's because the rising productivity of labor made possible by the institutions of a market economy, saving and investment and so forth. So, I mean, it's I like the, the vision these people are, are painting, and my point is just the market economy is the best way to achieve that. And this, this last sentence about, you know, under these reforms that Mr. Meyerson's proposing – it would make participation in the labor force truly voluntary and they, thereby enabling people to get a life. Well, th- just break that down. It, it can't be, we, we can't alter the laws of nature, right? So if people literally just stop growing food, we're all going to starve to death. There's no way around that. And you can't just say, well, that's unfair and I wish we were in a world that were different. No, people need to work in order to provide food and shelter and so on. And by the way, producing food is backbreaking work. It's hard to do that. It's 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 not a matter of, well, maybe people will just do it because they just love producing food. They produce it for the income. Right, exactly. So there there is that ultimate physical necessity or that you know the scarcity involved, and so that's why work is necessary in order to have these consumption goods and and enjoy a, a quality standard of living. And that, but that's still what you get in the market economy. And so I just think Meyerson is wrong if he thinks that, oh, the way to make sure everything is really voluntary, no one's forced to do anything, is to give the government more control over our lives. I mean, that's clearly anywhere in history where the government has seized a larger portion of the economic uh, allocation mechanism, those people are less free, not more free. And, and, and in terms of if, if the, well, how we're defining freedom or lack of freedom is by saying, oh, well, we really shouldn't have to work in order to survive. Well, yeah, that's not free in some cosmic metaphysical sense, but that's not because of capitalism. That's just because of the way reality works. Well, my point about uh, food production is the sort of point I would make about being a garbage man. Now, I, I'm not saying that a farmer is at the same level as a garbage man. Like, who knows, right? There's no way to, to compare them. But the point is that who would truly voluntarily, in, in the sense that Meyerson means it, want to to be a garbage man if he doesn't have to be, if he can just sit there. Well, likewise, who would want to engage in backbreaking labor 12 hours a day to produce food if he can just sit there? And the, the problem is that maybe, maybe Meyerson hasn't met a lot of human beings, but since they tend to want to a- acquire what they want and reach their ends with the least possible exertion, they're going to respond when you make it increasingly attractive not to do anything. You'll get more and more people not doing anything, and then fewer and fewer people doing the stuff that supports the people who aren't doing anything. And so the system becomes more and more top-heavy and unstable. And, and, and I can't even believe like we have to refute this. I mean, w- anytime you say that an idea is jaw-droppingly simple, you probably left something out. And yet that's what, that's what we've got here. All right, now right. here, this one I like. Take back the land. Ever noticed how much landlords blow? I mean, so in other words, absolutely no curiosity about how the world works at all. No curiosity about what the function of certain institutions is or what role is played by certain individuals. No, it's just all my emotional reaction. Ah, I don't like landlords. Ah, they own big buildings. How did they get them? Not through hard work. They just sit there all day. Well, you know what? What I just said is not far removed from what we're going to read here. They don't really do anything to earn their money. They just claim ownership of buildings. They claim ownership. Apparently there were buildings, and then people came along and just claimed them. They just claim ownership of buildings and charge people who actually work for a living the majority of our incomes for the privilege of staying in boxes that these owners often didn't build and rarely, if ever, improve. In a few years, my landlord will probably sell my building to another landlord and make off with the appreciated value of the land he or she, uh, I'm not going to do that, also claims to own which won't even get taxed as long as he or she 
plows it right back into more real estate. Think of how stupid that is. The value of the land has nothing to do with my idle remote landlord. It reflects the nearby parks and subways and shops, which I have access to thanks to the community and the public. So why don't the community and the public derive the value and put it toward uses that benefit everyone? Because capitalism is why. The most ma- I had to say that in that voice, by the way. The most mainstream way of flipping the script is a simple land value tax. By targeting wealthy real estate owners and their free rides, we, we can fight inequality and poverty directly, make disastrous asset price bubbles impossible, oh, I guess he wants to end the Fed, too, and curb Wall Street's hideous bloat. There are coolers out, uh, cooler ideas out there, too. Municipalities themselves can be big-time landowners, and groups can even create large-scale community land trusts so that the land is held in common. In any case, we have to stop letting rich people pretend they privately own what nature provided everyone. So I don't know, maybe there's a tinge of Henry George in here, but again, I'm going to say that Meyerson probably hasn't read Henry George. What do you say about this, Bob? Well, again, there's just so much here to target rich environment. Um, I think that, I mean, I, again, I, I hate to be sound like a broken record here, but clearly the person, it's not that the person is upset about any particular manifestation of the market economy. It's just the very notion that there's private property really makes this guy angry. He doesn't, why, why should there be private property? That's not fair. That doesn't make any sense to him. Uh, in this particular instance, though, uh, Murray Rothbard actually has a phenomenal essay on this, um, if, if you just Google Murray Rothbard, Henry George, you'll probably be able to, to find her or maybe critique of the, of the land tax, something like that. You'll be able to see it. And it's uh, it, it, and I like talking about this one because here it's really difficult to see exactly what, what is it that the, that the landowner does to justify the income that he would earn in a market economy um, in terms of a capital gain from this. You know, so if, if somebody goes and trains and becomes a brain surgeon and then he makes more money than somebody else who just um, works at a cafeteria or something, you know, people might say, well, maybe that disparity is a little bit too too big to be fair, but they kind of get the idea of why that sort of makes sense. Whereas here, geez, you know, somebody just buys a piece of property, then the community evolves and, you know, maybe there's a new sports team that comes in down the road or, or some hipsters start going to the coffee shops around there and all of a sudden it becomes a bustling area and then the property value goes up 50% and that owner gets to reap the benefits. That doesn't make any sense. That's completely unfair. Well, Rothbard walks through and says, it, these things, what determines what the value of the, the land was when the first person first bought into it? And so clearly, if the person was able to buy it, and then a few years later it's 50% more, and that surprises most people, it's because they didn't anticipate what was going to happen. And so the people who tend to pocket those capital gains on real estate, even if we call it, you know, unimproved, you know, that they didn't, it's not because they physically change the land or they didn't build a nice skyscraper on it. It's just the actual real estate, the ground itself became more valuable. Still, they either just got lucky or more likely they had some inkling that this property was going to go up in value and that's why they got into it ahead of time. And that actually, so it's not just a matter of a roulette wheel and these people happen to get lucky. It's that as with everything else where entrepreneurial profit is earned, the people who see a particular site and, and anticipate better than everybody else, I bet you this is going to be worth something in a few years. They're the ones who jump in and, and buy that. So even if we didn't talk about anything else, that right there is still reason you wouldn't want to have a land tax that, that sucks away all those gains because then you would totally eliminate the incentive for people to try to spot undervalued properties and get in there. And that's that's what you want people to do. All right. Let, the, me, uh, let, me, let me jump in for a second, though. So in other okay. words, what you're saying is because of entrepreneurial foresight, that, you know what, I think this community is going to be really developed someday, and there'll be little shops and restaurants, and people are going to want to be here, so I will build, they're going to want to live here, so in anticipation of this, I'm going to build housing for them that they don't even know that they're going to want yet, but when they finally wake up and realize they do want it, I will already have built it, because I have the incentive, I can get the, the land low now, and it'll be worth more later, and so the very fact that the building is there in the first place is an indication that the that the person whoever whether it's the subsequent owner who becomes a landlord or whatever but somebody somewhere along the line made the locational decision to build property in a place that people were going to want it yep that's exactly it i mean just to make it more obvious let's say it's uh you know the developers who developed uh, las vegas or something i mean at one point that was just empty desert 
And then somebody realized, hey, you know, if we really develop this thing, we're going to have a lot of, uh, you know, we're going to be able to sell it for a lot more down the road. And using Meyerson's logic, I mean, you could say, well, no, it wasn't the, the person who bought the the desert and then paid all the workers to build buildings and so forth. It was all the workers, you know, the people who were actually laying the cement and the the people who were installing the window panes in the casinos and everything. Those are the ones who actually built Las Vegas, and they should fully be compensated for the the change in value over there. You know, they should all be millionaires. And the person who had the foresight to see that and and buy the land and then hire all those people to create these things. You know, those people had nothing to do with it. They just sat back and collected the profit. I mean, I hope even the most, you know, virulent socialists can see at least, well, wait a minute, that's not really exactly an accurate description of what would have happened. So um, you're exactly right. Just to give another more esoteric example, Robert has a great thing. What really seems crazy is when you're driving around town and you see commercial real uh, buildings that are available for rent. You know, it's just an empty building. And it's available for rent, and you say, "Well, gee, how come there's not a business in there? How come there's not homeless people that are allowed to stay in there?" And the the answer is, "Oh, because those money grubbing capitalists are holding it off the market because they want to get a higher price." But Rothbard's point is that's good. You wouldn't want the the landlord to just rent out a, a space to the best available bidder the day after it becomes available. If they think that no, 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 if I just hold it off the market and spend some time searching, I bet you somebody a much more productive business is finally going to meet me and we'll, we'll coordinate, and then they'll come in, and maybe it'll be vacant for three months, but then there'll be a long-term business in here that's much more productive than the best bidder I can find if I have to have it filled by next Tuesday. And so just thinking through the logic of that and why you might hold property off the market to try to get a better rental price, that actually shows you that you're doing what you, what we would want people to do, what we would want landlords to do. So I guess in summary, the, the disposition of even just pure land factors even if we assume they're totally fixed, which they're not, because, you know, you could spend money draining swamps and, and, and developing the land and creating more land, even though you normally think of land as fixed. But even if it were totally fixed, there still is an entrepreneurial function in determining what projects are going to be sitting on each square acre of land. And, and that's something that needs to be allocated in a market, just like every other scarce resource. All right, let's go to number four. Make everything owned by everybody. You know, isn't it, isn't it incredible that we could solve all the problems of society with kindergarten slogans? I mean, who, who could have guessed this? Hoarders blow. Take, for example, the infamous 1% whose ownership of the capital stock of this country leads to such horrific inequality, which, by the way, is not actually that far removed from the typical Pareto 2080 distribution, but we'll leave that aside. We'll grant them that. Capital stock refers to two things here, the buildings and equipment that workers use to produce goods and services, and the stocks and bonds that represent ownership over the former. The top 10%'s ownership of the means of production is represented by the fact that they control 80% of all financial assets. All right, so it's, it's slightly skewed, but that's it, as compared to everywhere else in the history of the world, but not by that much. Uh, that's my editorial comment, obviously, not his. Th this detachment means that there's a way easier way to collectivize wealth ownership than having to stage uprising that sees the actual airplanes and warehouses and whatnot. Just buy up their stocks and bonds. When the government does that, it's called a sovereign wealth fund. Think of it like a big investment fund that buys up assets from the private sector and pays dividends to all permanent U.S. residents in the form of a universal basic income. All right, Bob, what about making everything owned by everybody? Well, again, we just have to ask, what's the function, what's the social function of having private property in the first place? And it's because there are all sorts of uh, informational issues, and or if you if you study Austrian economics, you understand Mises' point about economic calculation. You can make some more sophisticated argument, but it's that you there's somebody or some group of people have to determine in any society how are we going to use that barrel of crude oil? Are we going to burn it right now? Are we going to leave it in the ground? Are we going to pump it and put it in a barrel and put it in a, in a warehouse somewhere for future use? These decisions like that have to be made. And the point is, uh, there's various social mechanisms that have been proposed over history, and the market economy says we're going to give it to the, in the hands of the people who have proven in the past that they're good at forecasting the future, and they're good at anticipating what everybody else would want those resources to be used for. And that's all that it is. And let me just deal with one particular example. like Somebody like B Bill Gates, and, and yeah, I know he's not a paragon of the free market economy, but let's just take it at, at the simplistic comic book level. Yeah, he's a billionaire, but it's not because he has a bunch of mansions and yachts and so forth, and he's just surrounded by limos and, and big screen TVs. Most of his wealth is because of his ownership of, of Microsoft. 
And so really that's just the, the showing that he has a lot of influence over how all of Microsoft's productive assets are deployed. And so, yeah, we could, we could say, why don't we just seize his shares and distribute it to all the employees of Microsoft? But then do you really think that they're going to make the best decisions going forward? Or any you know other major shareholders of, of companies, especially as, as we get more to a free market economy and not crony capitalism, the idea is that the decisions have to be made about okay, what product are we going to introduce? Are we going to keep uh, debugging this software? Are we just going to release it as is? Are we going to take our business in this direction and just focus on the personal market, or are we going to go after the business sector? I mean, a lot of these people have no idea that large businesses need to make strategic decisions, and they often fail. I mean, just remember like the new Coke that they, they tried, and then they just quickly just roll that away. I mean, so it's not the case that these major companies just pay a bunch of pretty women and make commercials and everyone has to buy their product. No, they have to make strategic decisions, and that's why they pay so much for CEOs and whatnot, because it's a very competitive market, and it, it takes entrepreneurial foresight to make these right decisions. And if you have it just distributed amongst the mass of workers... There's no reason to expect those decisions are going to get better, and so we're all going to be poor for it. You know, Bob, I actually liked the new Coke. I'm one of the only people who will admit that. But when the new Coke came out, I thought, hey, yeah, you know what? This doesn't taste better. Now, I realize that doesn't, doesn't mean it wasn't a mistake. I mean, it was a mis- from my point of view, it was great. But I understand that you don't, you don't tinker with your long-term thing. But I miss the new Coke. You know, I wish, they would, I wish there was a niche market for the new Coke, because I would enjoy having it back. All right, now having made that embarrassing admission, let's just go. Doesn't the old Coke really blow? <laughs> well, well, listen to this last one, okay? A public bank in every state. You know what else really blows? Wall Street. The whole point of a finance sector is supposed to be collecting the surplus that the whole economy has worked to produce and channeling that surplus wealth toward its most socially valuable uses. It is difficult to overstate how completely awful our finance sector has been in accomplishing that basic goal. Let's try to change that by allowing state governments into the banking game. So no, no conception of how government might be involved already. There is only one state that currently has a public option for banking, North Dakota. When North Dakotans pay state taxes, the money gets deposited in the state's bank, which in turn offers cheap loans to farmers, students, and businesses. The Bank of North Dakota doesn't make CD destined to default loans, slice them up inscrutably, and sell them on a secondary market. It doesn't play around with incomprehensible derivatives and allow its executives to extract billions of dollars. It just makes loans and works with debtors to pay them off. Let me give you my commentary on this very quickly, and then we'll give your serious one. Here's my commentary. You know what else really blows? Debt. Why should we pay it? Why don't we just relieve everybody's debt? That would make everybody better off. That would give us a great economic stimulus, and it would really stick it to the rich people. Now, you know what? He could easily have made that number six, right? We wouldn't have batted an eye. So I don't see why he's, he's forcing debt on people when we could just abolish debt. Like, we've... Why do we not realize that, right? Why have we been living with the oppression of debt? Why don't we just get rid of it? So I think we should write to him. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe the Rolling Stone told him that he had to limit it to five. <laughs> uh, yeah, with, with this one, I mean, I, granted, this this person is not uh, well trained in the in the arts of economic science, but this one I'm a little bit more sympathetic because it, it really has been ridiculous what's been going on in the financial sector with Wall Street and the derivatives and all that kind of stuff and so i can and on top of it all how all these uh companies are paying huge bonuses after the bailouts when everybody else is still struggling right so i and i can see how from that person's point of view he can say wait a minute you free market economists were assuring us in 2005 and 6 that this was the market at work that these derivatives were slicing and dicing risk and this was so beautiful and this was capitalism, and that's why they deregulated everything, and then it blew up in our face, and we, the taxpayer, had to bail everybody out to save the system. Give me a break. And now you guys are telling me that, oh, it's the government's fault. So, like I say, I, I can understand why they wouldn't trust you or me to say, well, no, see, what happened was it was the Fed inflating everything, and what, and what we're describing is not at all what we're seeing play out in practice. But at the same time, I mean, even though I can understand why they wouldn't listen to us, nonetheless, we're right when we say that that the sorts of things this person's talking about, the excesses and the, the problems, are not because of the nature of just private property. It's because the, the financial sector is the most heavily regulated and the one in the U.S. at least where the government has the most influence. I mean, I mean, the Fed literally 
has a monopoly on, on the control of, of money. You know, it, in no other sector is that true, where the government literally decides that there's no other sector where there's a group of experts that determine what the market price is, the way that the Fed sets interest rates. Okay, so if you had to pick one area in the U.S. economy that comes closest to this guy's ideal of where the government's really involved, and it's not at all a distributed, decentralized mechanism of various private citizens, then it would be money and banking. And yet we can all agree that that's the area that's been totally screwed up the most over the last few years. So, I mean, that's sort of just like an empirical argument to show that this guy is barking up the wrong tree and giving the government more control is just a bad idea. I mean, just to have the government in charge of banking and matching up savers and borrowers, again, that's a horrible idea. Why would you expect politicians or the bureaucrats they defer to to be able to judge credit risk better than people whose own money is on the line? And it's true. You could say, well, yeah, but the, what we have right now is not the money on the line. They get bailed out. Right, so let's not have bailouts anymore. I mean, Austrian libertarians were certainly not in favor of any of those bailouts. All right, Bob, I'm going to let you run because I kept you a little longer than I would typically promise that I would. But I can't tell you how much better I feel now that you and I have talked this through. I mean, not like I felt like it was a threat to civilization, this little article, but but really just hearing, I don't know, just clear discussion of these issues when they, you know, they, I can imagine how they would sound superficially plausible to somebody who doesn't ever think about it. And that's why it's important to, you know, think and to listen to the Tom Woods show. What else can I say? So, Bob, I appreciate your time. What, what do you have going on that we can talk about and promote as we close today? Well, I uh, just in my blog, I just recently posted uh, a public lecture, an online lecture that I made available on supply and demand. So if people are curious about just the, the basics and how you think through things like that, I would uh, point people to consultingbyrpm.com, and you can see my uh, lecture for supply and demand analysis. All right. Thanks, Bob, for that and for your time today. Everybody who listens always appreciates it, as I do. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. All right, everybody. That was Bob Murphy. A couple quick program notes for you guys. I guess the first one isn't a program note. It's a note about where I'm going to be. I'm going to be at the College of Southern Idaho, March 1st, then March 5th, Washburn University in Topeka, Kansas, then March 15th at the University of Central Arkansas, and now April 9th at Florida Southern College. And either April 8th or April 10th, I don't know exactly which date yet, but one date around April 9th, I'll be at Liberty University in South Carolina. I haven't yet put up these April dates on my events page, but they will be up soon with the details. But for now, all my events in March are up at TomWoods.com, my personal site, the events page, TomWoods.com slash events. Tomorrow, we're going to be talking about Franklin Roosevelt with the author of New Deal or Raw Deal, Professor Bert Folsom of Hillsdale College. And then next week, we will be evaluating and ranking the presidents on President's Day. Then Judge Andrew Napolitano on Tuesday. We got Bitcoin next week. We got all kinds of interesting topics. So make sure you are subscribing because you would feel like such a loser missing out on these episodes. And don't forget, you guys are helping us out, helping me pay the bills here in my little Tom Woods show office. Every time you enter Amazon through the Amazon widget at TomWoodsRadio.com, at no cost to yourself, you help me keep the lights on here, and I sure appreciate it. All right, everybody, FDR tomorrow. We'll see you then. The Tom Woods Show.